listening to the debate, listening to the lobbying, listening to the um, thinking, the public thinking that was going on around uh, Lord Leicester's bill, there was a missing voice, it struck me, and that was the voice of the broader public. Sure, the interests of free speech to the broader public uh, was very much in the debate. But I think the, the bill, as it, was, uh, as it was published then in May, it was a bill for journalists, a bill for the media. And it was something that um, Lord Lester ex explicitly rebutted uh, back in August. He, he spoke to Ian Burrell from the Independent. He said, this is not a bill for the media. I want to emphasize that. It's a bill for those who are consumers of the media, the citizens, the people. Uh, and I don't think that is right, actually. But in any event, we're not now going to be getting Lord Lester's bill. On whatever bill we do eventually get, my hope is uh, that it better balances the interests of the wider public uh, and the media, certainly better than the libel laws that we have at the moment, uh, and certainly better than some of the ideas which I would like to come on to towards the end uh, that I've heard thrown around in, in the debate. Because I think that balance between the wider public, the public that uh, we're serving as journalists, uh, has been kind of missing um, over the last six months. Just to reiterate the things that aren't in dispute, responsible free speech obviously uh, is fundamental to a free society. Uh, libel actions are too costly, too unpredictable in the courses they take, they take too long to resolve, too likely to result in damages out of all proportion to the damage caused by the libel, and make life easy for those who would want to bully journalism uh, and those who are interested in uh, serious debate. Um, and I don't think many people would, uh, would doubt that we need libel laws that are more up to, uh, up to date, that acknowledge the wired globally networked media ecology, and they defend honest, responsible journalism on matters of public interest. Honest, well-sourced, fair-minded journalism, salient in the public interest, sh clearly shouldn't be inhibited or chilled, as, we, uh, uh, as the term has it. The problem we have, though, the problem we have is that not all journalism is honest, well-sourced, fair-minded, or in the public interest. And we journalists, particularly at gatherings like this, or when we're delivering those disingenuously uh, serious-minded, ironic, hypocritical keynote speeches at editors' conferences, we deceive ourselves about why we're loathed by the very public in whose interests we profess to report. We tell ourselves that it's because we're independent and bloody-minded, and we won't be bamboozled, we won't take pressure. We stand up to it, we tell it how it is. But actually, in our heart of hearts, we know it's none of those things. It's because many of us make up too much, too often. And then when we find out, we writhe and writhe and writhe, rather than put it right. And this is the problem, I think, at the heart of libel reform. This is the reality which the wider public, I think, is more aware of than those of us who are thinking um, more, in a more focused way about libel reform. There was an editorial back in 1999, I think it was, in The Observer, and it was about entrapment, actually. It wasn't about the, uh, the libel laws at all. Um, but it was about uh, a particular tabloid entrapment. I forget which one it was. Um, but the thrust of that editorial is just as important in this debate. And that leader argued that um, the freedom of the press is indivisible. The freedom of the tabloid press are those, sorry, the freedoms of the tabloid press are those of the broadsheet press. The sun does what it has to do as we do. A free press, warts and all, is an indispensable component of democracy. If we saw some warts last week, this is referring to the particular entrapment, don't forget that wider truth. So free press, warts and all. I don't believe many in our audiences, many in the wider public, believe that's true, and that should be true. And I think that's the problem that we have in trying to reform the libel laws. The laws that we need to protect and support the best in public interest journalism also legitimize the worst. And that's, I think, the danger that we have to uh, avoid. For every journalist who's frustrated in an honest investigation, there are dozens who frankly have lost touch with the idea that their trade is about honesty and uh, honestly checked facts. There are dozens who are mired in what Nick Davis called journalism. Uh, he described it in his book Flat Earth News, regurgitating unchecked copy, recycling unchecked cuttings. And there's an irony, if not again a hypocrisy here, that we journalists, we sagely nod at how these commercial pressures uh, are, uh, are driving down standards uh, in our trade. Uh, and yet we demand then that the law is changed to lower the truth test. Crazy. At the same time, for every bully whose lawyers use fear of the law to stifle revelations about themselves, and we know it does happen, 
There are thousands of ordinary people who see their reputations trashed by lies, half-truths, and gossip recycled as news, and they have next to no recourse. I've heard the figure used that 90% of libel cases in England and Wales are won by claimants. Incredibly, this is presented as a reason to change the law, and it doesn't seem to cross our minds as journalists that it might, just might, be a condemnation of the standards of journalism in this country. But it's, of course, it's also a very misleading figure. We know that many people, many ordinary people, who get to the point of considering a libel action, abandon it long before they get anywhere near a court and a jury. Most have neither the money, the expertise, or energy to go anywhere near a lawyer. And the true scale of mendacity remains unmeasured. And when we talk about the chilling effect of journalism, I wonder whether we consider how the broader, wider public might think about that phrase. That the one thing that those Express and Star journalists way back uh, could have done with when they were committing 106 libels of the McCanns. Maybe they could have done with a bit of chilling, do we think? Mm. Or that the journalists who had Colin Stagg banged to rights in the Rachel Nickel uh, case, or Tom Stevens in the Ipswich murders, or Chris Jeffries in the Yates murder case, couldn't they have done with a bit of chilling? I'm sure that's what the public out there uh, is thinking. And I think the problem is that the 80 odd percent of the British population who surveys tell us don't trust journalists to tell the truth are more likely to believe that journalism is too free to publish lies, gossip, and rumors. Truths, not that it requires to be more unconstrained in the name of free speech. So, five things that I think uh, that I would certainly uh, like to see uh, as part of the government's bill. Uh, a couple of them are negatives, actually. I don't, the first one is, I don't believe uh, that we really should be considering and arguing, as we have been arguing, uh, about reversing the burden of proof. Uh, whatever deterrent any such move, and I don't believe it, it, it's likely to happen, whatever deterrent that would have on libel bullies, it would also be a charter for reputational muggings. Uh, and I think people in the broader audience uh, would ask this question, why should uh, a vindictive journalist with no, or no more than nodding terms with the truth be able to publish whatever they like about you just because you happen to have strayed into this thing called the public domain, and then say it's down to you to prove that what you've said is untrue. I also think, for many of the same reasons, that it would be wrong to require a person liable to show real measurable damage. I think journalists, or some journalists anyway, need to get it into their heads that publishing a lie is a wrong in and of itself. We really should care as journalists that too many uh, in our audiences think that journalists are the kind of people who say what they like, shrug and walk away. The dogs bark and the caravan moves on. I think the third thing, we've, we've heard a little bit about this before, we already have um, in, in the, uh, the Nichols and Hoffman judgments the basis of a defence uh, of honest journalism. Uh, and we saw this through the, uh, the Reynolds defence, obviously, but also the Wall Street Journal and Jamil case and the, the later McLagan case. I think there is the, the shapings there of uh, uh, a defence of honest journalism. I'm no lawyer, I don't know whether that should or shouldn't be put on a statutory basis. Uh, but the kind of requirements that, or the kind of uh, tests uh, that Nichols and Hoffman laid down are actually uncannily similar to the kind of tests that we in the BBC apply to, uh, to our uh, journalism. I think the, uh, the fourth um, issue is, is the question of fair play in the multiple publication rule. I think there is a real problem here for gold diggers who can uh, go through archives and find uh, material that is, um, well, basically gold dust for them. But equally, I do think newspapers have got to, fair, have got to play fair with the public here. Uh, the truth of the matter is now with the web, once you're libeled, you're pretty well libeled forever. You're pretty well libeled forever. Uh, I mean, I just saw an apology today that the, the people published. Uh, this was an extraordinary apology, actually. Uh, it's to someone called Denise Welsh, who I understand is, is, is an actress. Um, a piece appeared in the, in the people. Uh, the people today published an apology saying, uh, we said that Denise Welsh gave an interview to us about personal issues concerning her marriage to Tim Healy. I think this was that they were using Viagra. We accept that she did not say these things. She did not say them to us, and we apologize to both of them for what was published. Now, you kind of wonder what was going on here. However, if the people were playing fair, you'd expect that piece to be taken down, wouldn't you? And not just some mealy-mouthed apology put around it. Well, indeed, the piece was taken down, but littered through the people's sight, are references in the letters and in other articles and links to the substance of that, uh, uh, that untruth. 
Now, you know, if we're going to bring the libel laws into the 21st century, uh, media organizations have got to play fair and do what I have done on occasion, which is remove uh, material, including all links to it, any reference to it, completely from databases. But the fifth thing, I think, is the key to this whole, uh, this whole uh, uh, matter, and that is the simplification and the acceleration of, of resolution. Whether it's through some new body, whether it's through some new set of arrangements, I think this is the absolutely uh, key issue here. The problem with libel is, of course, the court case in front of a jury and the shadow that casts over honest journalism and public discourse. And many times in my career in the BBC, I've had lawyers say to me, um, can you prove that? You need to prove that. This is what they will do. And you can feel the shadow growing. The, the standard of proof is much higher in the BBC than anywhere else. And of course, we, um, we listen to our lawyers much more closely. Um, but I think it, it's this speed of resolution that's the, the, the important thing, whether it's through a new body, uh, whether it has a defined scale of damages uh, or the power to limit time, whatever it is, that I think is, is the key to it. And it would also have the added benefit uh, of getting rid of the absurd PCC and Editors Code Committee uh, and in, instead produces, uh, introduces proper independent arbitration. So in broad terms, the, the libel laws we have, they don't work. They don't work for the media, they don't work for free public debate, and they don't work for the thousands out there. Uh, a tiny minority of whom actually are evil corporation, uh, corporations or Russian oligarchs or whatever, um, who are the victims of slapdash or vindictive journalism. Uh, so I think if we are going to change uh, the law, uh, the better to protect free speech. It can't be an unqualified uh, protection. By all means, let's increase the protection for responsible publication, publication that is honest. Um, but let's understand that hand in hand with that has to go measures to ensure that remedy is swift, prominent, permanent, and inexpensive and doesn't appear to legitimize the very practices that make journalism so untrusted, I think.